Numbers chapter number 9. We'll begin reading in verse 15. And the Bible says, And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony. And at evening there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. So it was always. The cloud covered it by day, and the appearance of fire by night. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed. And in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. Let's pray. Father, we do bless you. Lord, you are a good God. Why you ever look into the affairs of men, I know not. But God, I appreciate in your holiness, and in your glory, and in your greatness, you love sinners. God, we're glad you made a way where old sinners could be saved. And then God, when you save us, you don't leave us like you found us. You change us. And you begin to equip us. And Lord, one of these days, we're going to get to abode with, abide with you in the abode of God and in your glory forevermore. And God, we bless your holy name. Now God, thank you for the good singing. Thank you for a good Sunday school hour. Thank you, Lord, for your people. Lord, we're thankful we can come out to the house of God today and worship. Lord, there are places in the world they don't have this privilege. There are places in our country where this privilege is being attacked. And so, Father, we're thankful and grateful we could come and worship you in spirit and in truth today. Now, Father, help us from the Word of God. Lord, if you don't do something, then nothing will get done. And so, Father, I pray you'd help us. I pray that uh, you would illuminate our minds. You would enlighten us to truth. I pray that, Lord, you would help us to ever to draw closer to God. I pray revival would break out even in our midst. Uh, we do pray for those that are hurting, those that are struggling, those that are facing obstacles and opposition, that, God, you'd give them victory, you'd give them help, you'd give them strength. Uh, God, we certainly pray in a crowd this size if there's somebody here unsaved, they don't know Christ. We pray they'd come to the saving knowledge of Christ before it's everlasting too late. Now, Father, we need you. Without you, we can do nothing. So, Father, I pray you just uh, 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 put your hand upon this uh, uh, congregation right now. Take up your abode, uh, head just in, and get glory to your glorious name. We'll thank you for it, for it's in the wonderful and holy name of the Lord Jesus. We ask these things. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to several things in this chapter. Bear with me. When they did my throat sur or my neck surgery, they had to move my esophagus, so uh, I don't know how strong it'll be, but we'll give it a shot. But in this chapter, you find four basic themes. You find the keeping of the Passover. We know in Exodus chapter 12, the Lord instructed Moses on that night uh, about sprinkling the blood over the doorpost of every home, and then when the uh, death angel came, when he saw the blood, he would pass over them. Uh, and that became a perpetual covenant between Israel and God. Uh, and here in Numbers chapter number 9, God is instructing Moses that it would be a perpetual covenant, uh, that it was to be uh, uh, done once a year. And we find uh, the keeping of the Passover in this chapter. Uh, we also find in this chapter uh, uh, instructions for the polluted. You find the keeping of the Passover in the first five verses. Uh, and then from verses 6 through 14... Uh, we find instances where people wouldn't be allowed to worship uh, if they'd handled dead bodies or if they were uh, uh, strangers to Israel and they were polluted. Uh, and God makes provision through Moses uh, on how those who were polluted could worship. Uh, then we find in verses 15 through 23 the pitching of the tabernacle. Uh, we know why they were in Israel or in the wilderness that Israel had a a structure they could take up and put down like a tent uh, that was uh, their tabernacle where they were to worship in. Uh, it housed the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and we find that uh, uh, he instructs them uh, uh, when and how to pitch the tabernacle. Uh, and then the, the chapter concludes uh, 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 in verses 15 and 16 uh, 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 really uh, uh, with the presence of the Lord. Look again, if you will. Verse 15, And on that day 
the tabernacle was reared up the cloud covered the tabernacle namely the tent of the testimony and at evening there was upon the tabernacle as it were the appearance of fire until morning so it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night can you imagine God being so concerned about his people and wanting them to have peace in the midst of their journeying through the wilderness in the midst of their troubles in the midst of their trying times to realize he was there they could look at the tabernacle and during the day they'd see a cloud over it say God's there at night they'd look out their tent and there's a pillar of fire resting above the tabernacle they say God's still there he's still there and uh, my dear friends I'm interested in verse 16 where it says so it was always so it was always and with God's help that's what I want to preach on so it was always now I know what you're thinking you're thinking shouldn't that say always mm, don't you think God knows what he should pin down mm. it says always not always why? Well, I'm fixing to tell you. The application of the term always uh, means time. The application of the word always means way. Sometimes God lets us know He's there always. He's there in our way. But my dear friends, when He's there always, that means all the time. Mm. And so it was way that means brother Jim he was there perpetually brother Bob that means he was there continually brother Tommy that meant he was there constantly so it was always and my dear friends what assurance whether they saw the cloud or whether they saw the pillar of fire they could say God was there so it was always uh, what just on the first day of the week it was every day of the week uh, God was there always uh, he was there perpetually and constantly and continually uh, what a blessing to know God was there uh, can I help you tonight or this morning uh, uh, we don't have a pillar over top of the uh, tabernacle today we don't have a cloud over the tabernacle today uh, but we have uh, the promises of the word of God uh, and I've got good news for you. Uh, you and I can know that he's here always. Uh, and what a blessing to know when you pull up the driveway to come into church that God's going to meet with us. Uh, what a blessing to know uh, uh, he's never failed us. He's always uh, uh, manifested himself and showed us something from the precious promises of the Word of God. Uh, and that's blessing. But Brother Michael, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be a blessing to know that not only over the tabernacle, that he's with us always can I say the Bible says that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise and then the Bible goes on to say that we are the temple of the Lord and I want to know always that he's with me I want to know always that he's there and that he has the answers for my life and, and I can draw peace and strength from the fact that I know God is there uh, I alluded to going in uh, on surgery and you know I'm, uh, the older I get surgery is becoming a common thing uh, but I never fret and I'm not flippant when people pray for me but I try to tell them once you pray for somebody that's lost I'm okay mm. see I don't go into an operating room all tore up because I don't go in alone there's someone greater than the surgeon that's going to put his hands on me uh, there's one that put his hand on me 47 years ago uh, and he said that he never leave me nor forsake me so it was always and so I got to thinking about having the presence of God always and it requires some things if you're going to have his presence always you can't just show up and expect God to show up how am I doing, Miss Mary? Have I scared you yet? I'm doing okay, huh? Kind of staying right here. I'm doing all right. She's over there, a nervous wreck, huh? It'll be all right, Mary. It'll be okay. Everybody give her a baby aspirin. She'll be all right. So how do we have the presence of God always, Brother Phil? What are the requirements? Well, first of all, it takes accordance. Accordance. 
we got to be in accord with Him. And then we need to be in accord with one another. You see, to be in accordance with Him means that we comply with Him. He has made Himself the standard, and He has given us the standards in order to meet with Him. So where two or three are gathered in His name, He'd be in the midst. But He's also told us, Seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened, ask and you shall receive. And He's given us certain uh, requirements that we've got to comply with in order for Him to meet with us. And by the way, if we uh, uh, harbor sin in our hearts, uh, iniquity in our lives, He won't even hear our prayers. So there are certain requirements that must be met if we're going to be in accord with Him. Now, if I went into surgery with Brother Bob and I hadn't talked with him, hadn't walked with him, hadn't spent time with him, if I'd become defiled like what Brother Jordan taught in Sunday school this morning, I wouldn't be so confident when I went in under the knife. You see, it's not anything to do with my relationship with God. I'm saved, and I'm saved forevermore, but it has to do with my fellowship with God. And to be in accord with Him, I've got to be in fellowship with Him. He's got to be pleased with my life. I have to comply with the standard that He has set before us, the Word of God. And when I, to the best of my ability, have applied the Word of God to my life and lived by the Word of God, guess what? I have an accordance with Him. But then we need to be in accord with one another. The Apostle Paul, in every epistle he wrote to, to a church, said something like this, that they were to be in accord, that they were to have the same mind, that they were to have the same love. In other words, they, they were to be like-minded. You see, we come in here this morning, if we come in and we all got a different ad agenda, God's not going to meet with us. But when our agenda is Him, oh, He'll meet with us. You see, you can't get a crowd this large together and we sit down and start talking about any topic and it won't be long we'll find out we don't all think the same on every topic. A lot of it's based on how we were raised or how we've been educated, what we've read after. But there's a beautiful thing that God can take Hoosiers and God can take Buckeyes and God can take Hillbillies. And what do we call Californians? God can take Liberals. Hey, God saves liberals. There she sits, huh? But how can we all come together? Well, when God saves us and He seals us, we all have a kindred spirit. And see, it's no longer about being a Hoosier or about being a Buckeye or about being a liberal or a hillbilly or anything else. It's all about Christ. Not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And when we come to hear about Him, we come to worship Him. We come to put our focus on Him. Oh, my dear friends, He'll be with us always. Did not He teach David that as long as David served Him and kept His commandments, there'd never be any of David's lineage that would fail on the throne of God? It lasted one generation. Till Solomon turned his heart to serve other gods. Can I say... Every promise that God has ever given in the Scriptures were always eternal promises. And God keeps them until man breaks them. But as long as we are in accord with God and we comply with God, we come seeking after God, hungering after God, wanting the things of God, as long as we uh, lay aside any petty difference that we can come to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, God will meet with us. Now listen, there are no big eyes and little U's in the service of God. There's Christ, and then there's us. And there's nothing about us that ought to be important enough that supersedes Him. So as long as we keep that in perspective, He'll meet with us. But here's what happens, Brother Ron. You'll get somebody in the church, and all of a sudden it becomes all about them. My right to my claim to myself. By the way, that's the essence of sin. That's selfishness. And they'll grieve the Holy Ghost. So, 
if we want God to meet with us always, it comes in accordance. I'm glad we got a church where folks come to see Jesus. Where folks come to hear about Jesus. I'm glad we have a church where folks esteem others better than themselves. We got a loving church, and a caring church, and a giving church. I'm thankful to be a part of that kind of church. But not only does it take accordance, but can I say this? It takes an appetite. I will say, thank the Lord, I didn't need diet pills. All I needed was surgery, and that helps me. I've lost a little bit of weight. That's a good thing until after I start getting my appetite back. And let me thank everybody. I got enough Swiss rolls to last me till Christmas until I get my appetite back. Now I got about a week's supply. But thank you all. Uh, people brought me Swiss rolls and all my favorite things. I, I appreciate it. I just haven't had much of an appetite. You know what happens when you don't have an appetite? You get weak. Miss Nett keeps throwing food on my plate and says, You need to eat. Well, I don't feel like eating. Eat anyway. You need your strength. Need protein. Well, can I say, appetite and what we eat is very important to our physical bodies. Now, if you want to have sugar problems, eat Swiss rolls all the time. I can attest to that. Uh, at least I didn't get caught taking them on the airplane. You're the only person I've ever known that almost got thrown out of an airport because you had too many snack cakes in your bag. That is a true story. You know, they got the TSA to catch smugglers. There he is. Twinkie Traveler. He's afraid Walt Disney didn't have any Twinkies. So. But listen, one, one writer said, you are what you eat. If you don't eat healthy, you're going to suffer consequences. Now, I know, I don't like to eat healthy. You know, I... I liked it when they cooked with lard. And uh, Miss, Nut, Miss Nett kicks, cooks with, with real butter. I don't like that imitation junk. Are you listening? And lots of it. And I think there ought to be gravy on everything. As a matter of fact, if you put gravy on it or barbecue sauce, I can probably eat it. Unless it's Chinese. I ain't even going to try They don't make enough gravy to get that stuff down. Uh, Mama didn't raise me to eat out of a trash can. Anyway, you are what you eat. If you don't eat a lot of protein, you don't eat your vegetables, you don't eat fruit, you don't, you're going to have some health issues. What can I say? Spiritually, if you don't have the right appetite, you're going to be a weak Christian. That's why there are folks that are saved, but they're scared to death about everything going on in the world right now. They're eating from the wrong cookie jar. Are you listening? There are folks who are weak spiritually because they're feasting on worldly things. It doesn't work. Now listen, when you got saved, God didn't just uh, take away your old fleshly nature, but He gave you a new nature. And the one you feed the most will be the strongest. So you've got to have an appetite for some things spiritually if you're going to have His presence always. I thought about some of the things we ought to have an appetite for. We ought to have an appetite for His touch. I'd rather have His touch than all of man's compliments and acclaim. I'd rather have His touch than all that money can give. Hmm? It's nothing like His touch. Knowing He's there. Knowing His presence, there's nothing like it. I'd rather have His touch than anything. Can I say, there are folks that think, boy, if I just get a, get a bigger house, life will be better. And God blesses them to get a bigger house, but life isn't better. If I just get a fancier car, or if I just get a better job, or if I get more friends, or I get this, or if I get that. You know what you need more than anything? You need His touch. 
Because if you have his touch, nothing else really matters. You need an appetite for his touch. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with having a nice house, driving a nice car. Nothing wrong with, uh, you know, living a nice life, a comfortable, and nothing wrong with any of that stuff. God blesses you with it. God bless you. I, I've been bored. I ain't allowed to do nothing. Miss Nett's been chauffeuring me around everywhere, so I started looking at trucks. I did. I went and made a deal on one on Friday, but it's in the service, so I couldn't drive it. And then I found the same exact truck somewhere else. So we went yesterday, and I went and I drove it. Well, she drove it. And she drove it about a quarter mile. She said, you're not going to like this side. I'm talking about, Brother Phil, this one had all the bells and whistles. This truck had things I didn't even know they put in vehicles. I'm not kidding you. It's, it's something else. And so she pulled it over. I said, pulled it over. I didn't hear what he said, but it's not important. Five-wheel drive. It had something. So she pulled it over. She said, you're going to need to drive this thing. So I took my neck brace off, and I drove the thing. I pulled it back into dealership. Salesman come out and said, what do you think? I said, I think I'll keep the one I got. You know, mine's got pushing... 170,000 miles on it and been down the road a few times but I want to tell you something that one with all the bells and whistles it didn't drive as good as mine it wasn't as comfortable as mine and be honest with you it wasn't mine say were you upset you didn't buy a truck no if I wanted a truck I'd have bought the truck no I'm just glad that God gave me enough sense to know when something's right and when it's not right I'd rather have his touch driving an old truck than to have a new truck and lose all sight of him. Now, that's not saying you can have a new truck and not have God. But it just wasn't right. So what are you going to do? I told Ned, I said, I'll just keep mine. It blows up. I'll get that engine Brother Mike's got over there, and that one's got about 300,000 miles we'll put in. All right. Huh? You say, what are you trying to say, preacher? You ought to have an appetite for his touch. See, when you gain insight and an appetite to see him, the things of the world become strangely dim. They lose their significance. John the Baptist said it this way, I must decrease and he must increase. We ought to have an appetite for his truths. Aren't you tired of being lied to? How many lies do they have to catch Grouchy Fauci in? You do know he is the highest paid federal employee, don't you? Makes over $400,000, not counting how much he makes all them TV appearances. To stand up there and lie. And they called him, Rand Paul, he called him on the carpet a few months ago. And now the truth came out this past week. Rand Paul was right. The sucker's been lying to us. The sucker helped fund this uh, vaccine and helped fund the virus and helped fund all this stuff. He's making money hand over fist and telling you you got to wear a mask. I'd rather have truth, wouldn't you? I can't stand being lied to. Mm. Can I say, you listen to a lot of things going on in this world, they'll lie to you. Again, there is a virus but I read this. This is a truth. They say the odds of a piece of a meteor falling out of the sky and hitting you are like 0.046%. They say that you catching COVID and dying from it, the odds are 0.026%. So he said, there's a greater odds that a meteor's going to fall out of the sky and kill you than COVID. So get a helmet and throw away your mask. Now, obviously, if you are sickly, if you have respiratory problems, obviously, if you dwell in a nursing home, COVID's going to affect you a whole lot differently than somebody that's healthy. 
But taking these kids and jabbing them and making these kids wear masks and all, that's child abuse. And you're welcome. I mean, I just want truth. Don't you want truth? You know the only place you're going to find absolute truth is the Word of God. It's forever settled in heaven. And when you hunger for His truths, again, He says, Seeking you shall find. You see, COVID isn't that big a deal when you realize how big a deal Christ is. We ought to also have an appetite or a longing for His trust. Boy, you hear a lot of preaching on we ought to trust Christ. I wonder if Christ can trust us. You ought to long to have such a relationship with Him that He can trust you. You know, there are some people who couldn't trust you with their secrets. Because you'd blab them. Well, if people can't trust you, you think Christ can trust you? Boy, we ought to have such a relationship with him and hunger for, for him so much that he can trust us. You know why a lot of churches don't have revival? God can't trust them with it. Won't be long and they'll be taking the credit for it. I hear a lot of these preachers that are building names for themselves in this day and age. It's all about them. They drive buses with their picture on it. I'm really not impressed. Huh? Heard recently one, one, one preacher said he wanted to have about 16 young preachers under him that he can mentor them how to become like him. Friend, I just want to be like Christ. Yeah. 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 The problem is... is we could put a tent up in Florence, that guy show up and hundreds would show up to hear him. We turn one of our preachers loose, nobody'd show up, including some of you. If we're going to have him present always, we've got to be in accordance. We've got to have the right appetite. Thought about this. We also need to have the right affection. We ought to have an affection for God. We ought to love Him supremely. There's not a day goes by, I don't tell Miss Ned I love her. But can I say there's not a day goes by, I don't tell Christ that I love Him. But can I say, you know how you prove to Him that you love Him? By loving the things He loves. Say, preacher, why do you still sing out of hymn books? Because Jesus loves hymns. He wrote Ephesians chapter 5, speaking to yourselves with spiritual songs and hymns. Hmm. Can I say, preacher, why do you still have church three times a week? Because I can't get them here five times a week. Huh? Because Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. I just want to hang out where Jesus loves. and He loves the church. Preacher, why do you still use the old Bible? Because it speaks of him. Plus, he's the one that wrote it. And he loves this book. He magnified it above his holy name. You see, when you have the right affection, you love the things Jesus loves, he can't help but show up. Not only at church, but every day in your life. You would be amazed that the text and the phone calls I receive, preacher, pray for me. And I'm thinking, why don't you pray? And then it real, I, I realized it, Brother Ron, because they'd have to get right with God in order for God to hear their prayer, and they're dependent on me to pray for them. There's nothing greater than saying, Lord, and him saying, yes. See, when he's present, you don't have to, you don't have to go through a whole lot to get his attention. Because he's there. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to have the presence of God all the way. Well, it requires accordance and appetite, affection. It requires adoration, praise. The Bible says he inhabits the praise of Israel. 
The more you praise Him, the more He shows up. Throughout your day, you ought to just tell Him how wonderful He is. Throughout your day, when you're driving to work or driving down the road, looking up and seeing a beautiful day and a beautiful you know, skyline and just say, Lord, thank you for making this so I can see it. God, you're great. You're so wonderful. God, thank you for saving a wretch like me. God, thank you for being so good to me and my family. And God, thank you for giving us a good church. And God, just, and just start praising him and thanking him for all that he is. You know what happens? He shows up. There have been many times I start heading out to a meeting and go preach somewhere and get to talking to the Lord. Next thing I know, I'm somewhere down in Georgia and don't even know how I got there. It's all right. It's a good trip. He just gets in the truck with me and we have a good time. There's nothing like him. You know, when the church starts praising him, he just shows up. I wonder how our services would be when we come in if all we did was stand around and talk to each other and tell each other how good God is. Just walk up, Brother Donald, what did God show you this week from the Word of God? Miss Tara, just tell me how God blessed you this week. Just start talking that way. Instead of asking people about the weather. You want Him to be present? Just adore Him. Clinton Robin had brought the grandbaby today. She is so precious, so pretty. You don't have to ask them twice to brag on her. And they should. That's the blessing for not killing their kids. <laughs> but I wonder if we're so quick to brag on Jesus the same way. Talk about this lastly. Got to finish this before Mary has that heart attack over there. How are we going to have his presence always? Through a basement. Not a basement, a basement. What does that mean? Through hum humility. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Who are we that God would even give a second thought about? Let alone go to the cross and bleed and die for us. And who are we, even after he saved us, to just walk with us and talk with us and be good to us and bless us so much? I mean, God be just thrown us off into hell for things we've said and done since we got saved. So who are we to come in and think we're anything? It's all about him. When you have a humble spirit about you, God's pleased. But I, I can't stand an arrogant preacher. You want to you make me puke real quick, put a plate of Chinese food in front of me, or an arrogant preacher, either one. But you know what kind of preacher I love? Kind of gets up and says, he's not worth the power to take the blow away, but he'll tell you about Jesus. Hmm. Yeah. I want somebody that's real. See, we showed abasement through humility, through honesty. I realize in a lot of churches you get in trouble if you're transparent. You see, because we've become so uh, accustomed to coming to church acting like, you know, we don't have any problems and everything's great. When in reality, we all have problems. And God's great, but not everything's great. Hmm? I told Miss Nett last Friday evening I should have spent the night in the hospital. But see, my pride and my ego said, no, I'm going home. You get sick in hospitals. So I went home. Well, when I tried to get into bed Friday night, I was wishing I had a hospital bed. Are you listening? Sometimes you just need to be honest, you know, People come in and say, Preacher, how you doing? I say, I'm getting better. I'm not 100%. I got news for you. I'll never be 100% again. Gosh, I'm old. But think about it. We come in and we act like we have no problems. When all we need to be is honest. Yeah. 
I'm struggling today, but by God's grace, I'll get through it. What's wrong with being honest? Well, preacher, I've had a bad week, but by the grace of God, I'm here. I'm at church today. I need some help. What's wrong with being honest? I do believe Revelation 21 down about verse number 8 when it gives the list of people going to hell it says in all liars a bunch of Baptists need to do some checking up but when you're truly humbled it's because you're honest you're honest before God God I need you I need help God appreciates honesty see he already knows but when we admit it to him, business starts picking up. But also, a sense of helplessness. As long as you think you can handle it, God will let you try. But it's a good day when you throw yourself on his mercy and say, God, without you, I can't do anything. And you just admit your own helplessness. You know, it's by the grace of God that when your feet hit the floor, you're able to stand up. It's only by the grace of God your, your heart's pumping your blood through your body and your lungs are inhaling, exhaling the air that God you know, owns. It's only by the grace of God that you have what you have. And when you realize all God has to do is stop your blood flow for about 30 seconds, your life would change dramatically. When you become helpless for God, that, that just kind of helps God not to squeeze off your air flow, your blood flow, or any other flow because you're dependent on him I want his presence and his presence comes with being honest and admitting to him Lord without you I, I can't do this and he'll just show up and help you now, I do appreciate I picked on Miss Mary and there's been several who's worried that I might preach too soon or I might overdo it and I appreciate their con consent they could have a preacher they didn't care about and they're hoping he drives off a cliff you know I'm, I'm glad I'm glad they're concerned. But the truth be told, you know, I was just a, a shell of what, how I normally preach, but I gave some truth out today. And the truth be told, when God gave me the message, he knew that he'd have to help me to deliver the message. But it all came to fruition when I told God, God, you're going to have to help me. And he has. I just want his presence in you. Well, I like coming to church when he's here and he manifests himself. But I sure like it in my life every day when he reminds me he's there. When he'll do something to show his handiwork. Boy, there's been some beautiful sunsets lately. He's just showing his handiwork. And, you know, just being able to walk around the block has been a real blessing. I'm thankful. I like his presence. And he told Israel, so it was always. Until Israel got used to it, and it didn't impact them anymore. There's a great danger when we get used to his presence so, more, so much that it doesn't impact us anymore. God help us to long for his presence and not take advantage of it. You may be here today, and a lot of what I had to say didn't make any sense to you because you're not saved. You may be a good moral person. You may be a better moral person than some people who claim to be saved. But friend, if your sins have not been washed with the blood of Jesus Christ, and you have not repented and trusted Christ as your Savior, it don't matter how moral you are. The greatest thing that ever happened to you is you get born again and become part of the family of God. So, preacher, I'm waiting for the right time. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Now, let me help you something. You didn't choose the day that you got born into this world. And friend, you won't choose the day when you'll get saved. You'll get saved when God's dealing with you about getting saved, by letting you hear that you need to be, get, that you need to be saved, and you put your faith and trust in Christ. 
or friend, you'll die and go to hell. There's nothing like being saved and nothing like having the presence of God in your life. If you're here today and you're unsaved, there's a hole in your heart. There's an emptiness. There's a void. And people try to fill that void with all kinds of things, Miss Marcy. Some through substance abuse. Some through hobbies and crafts. Some will try to fill that void starting this week with uh, football, you know, sports, entertainment, all kinds of things. They want that, that, and they'll go all at it. Go guns to fill that void. But Doug, been a lot of money spent, people trying to fill a void, only for that void to never be satisfied. That void you have is a place in your heart that was made for God. And you'll never be satisfied till you give your life to Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you're not saved, Jesus let you come by this way today so you could hear that he loves you. He wants to save you and change your life. Say, preacher, I don't know how to be saved. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation. That's a fancy word. We're just going to invite you to come to Jesus. And if you'll come, we'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you how to be saved. You can be saved today. It's very simple. We made it so simple even a child can understand. Matter of fact, so many times we as adults, we try to talk ourselves out of it because we make it more complicated than it is. The Bible is very clear. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you're willing to put your faith and trust in him, he'll save you. Change your life. Be that presence in your life that we've talked about. But I wonder, those of you who've been saved, how long has it been since you felt his touch? How long has it been since that spiritual cloud and pillar's been over your life, over your church life, over every facet of your life? How long has it been? See, he's always present. But if we don't become in accord with him and have an appetite for him, we won't feel his presence. I wonder, are you tired of not having his presence? He's right where you left him. It's amazing we can hunger after foolish things that won't matter. But eternal things we don't hunger after. I wonder, will today be the day that God really changes your life? for all time and eternity where his presence becomes so real to you nothing like him I wonder you tired of the mundane you know if some of God's people start hungering for his presence and get right we might see sinners get saved but how can we expect them to want God when we don't want God God help us I wonder today is it all way in your life right now? If not, it can be. Starting today and forevermore, His presence. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.